Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started tonight. Again, Father, thank you for the privilege of coming to your word and hearing you speak to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who enables us to understand and to hear you and then strengthens and empower us, empowers us to, embark, to obey you. So we yield to his ministry in this moment. In the precious name of Christ, we pray. Well, as we continue to look at John chapter 15 and our Lord's teaching in the upper room, and again, I encourage all of you to always interpret Scripture in context. Our Lord's public ministry has ended. Now he is in the upper room preparing his disciples for what lies ahead of them. He's about to be betrayed and arrested, illegally condemned, crucified, rise again, and go back into heaven. But he has begun to promise them in John 14, I will not leave you alone. I will send another of the same kind, and he will not only be with you, he'll live on the inside of you. And he will enable you to be everything that I have instructed you to be, that I have redeemed you to be. So we saw last week, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 15, our Lord returns to the teaching of the Holy Spirit on the Holy Spirit. So let me begin reading with 26 down through 16:4. 6, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify about me. Now watch what happens when you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's not a mystical, unknowable thing, folks. He would have never, ever given us the Holy Spirit and commanded us to be controlled by him if it wasn't something that was to be a reality in our life. Most of us never understand that. You will testify because you've been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. And these things go all the way back to John 13. That starts the upper room discourse. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think these offering service to God. These things they will do to you because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. He's about to go away from them. So one thing that all of us need to have grasped by this moment as we've worked our way through chapter 15, what God expects of your life and my life, if I have a genuine relationship to him, what does he expect of me? What is it my life is to manifest? And he's been very clear in John 15, his purpose and plan for our lives as genuine believers, is to produce fruit. Fruit. That's why he said you shall be known by your fruit. I cannot probably be called a disciple of the Lord Jesus if I am not producing fruit. And there is a progression in that fruit, more fruit, much fruit. And that's why Jesus said you have to absolutely depend on the vine, <clears throat> the life of Christ in us. Then one more thing I need to understand. Abiding in him, producing fruit, is not an end in itself. It is rather to bring glory to God. Does my life bring glory to him in my daily walk? In my conversation, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, The Father is glorified when you, abide, when you abide and bear fruit. And when you produce much fruit, 
I prove that I am a disciple. This is a growing experience. I pray you're not where you were this time last week. And this time next week, you'll be further along than you are tonight. Someone has very aptly put it like this. Some older Christians enter a kind of semi-retirement in their service for God. They just retire. And he's not necessarily talking about age, folks. There have been some who've been Christians for a long time. They've never comprehended the overall purpose and plan of God for their lives through the great salvation. And there comes a time when there is just semi-retirement in their service for God. So the result of that, we stop glorifying God. That's why you and I are on the face of this earth tonight, not only to know that we have eternal life, to br but to bring honor and glory to the Heavenly Father. Uh, in Psalm 92, 14, I love this verse. They still bear fruit in old age. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are. As believers, we are to be producing fruit. A.W. Tozer, in his book, God Tells the Man Who Cares, he writes this. Men think of the world not as a battleground, but as a playground. We are not here to fight. We're here to frolic. We are not in a foreign land. We are at home. We are not getting ready, nearly ready to live. We're already living. Believers should be growing more and more homesick. Wow, are we homesick? Th this is not our home down here. And the Lord Jesus is preparing these disciples. And therefore, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's preparing you and me. Now remember, our Lord Jesus is dealing with a bunch of disciples that are full of fear and anxiety. And if that should ever speak to a culture and our country right now, it's what's going on. I, I was in Drug Emporium today, and the two, lady was ahead of me checking out. And, and I get a, she had so many tubes of uh, cream, I didn't know if I was going to get out of there. And she and the uh, person checking her out were having a little conversation. And I heard the lady checking out saying, I thought we'd be beyond this by now. And she's talking about the pandemic. And I... I had to bite my tongue to keep from chiming in and say, you're not going to get out of it. Not until we begin to realize what is happening and what's going on, we're going to stay in it. Wow. We settle down in the world and we frolic instead of fight. We're in a battle. It's not a playground. And yet we don't seem to take all of that seriously. Our Lord is speaking to a group of men. All of us know John chapter 14, first verse, let not your heart be troubled. These disciples are troubled. Jesus has declared to them he's going back into heaven, and they're full of anxiety, they're full of fear, they're full of worry. And he wants them to know, as he wants you and me to know, that my going back to heaven is a part of the Father's plan to redeem the world. And part of that redemptive plan was to go to the cross, die in our place, be resurrected and ascend back into heaven and send the Holy Spirit. That's part of God's plan. He promised that he would not leave them alone. I will send the Holy Spirit, and when he comes, he will teach you everything that I've shared with you and then give you the courage to stand. We don't really know about that yet in America, but it's coming. Until somebody stands up to what is going on, it's coming. He promised that in the midst of all of this, you will know the truth of his word and comfort in the continuous presence of the Holy Spirit. 
those disciples lacked maturity. Jesus had been teaching them faithfully for all of the three years they had been with him. But they still did not fully understand. They had not yet been fully put to the test. But they were about to be. And that's why he is preparing them and us. The only hope that you and I have tonight, folks, of overcoming fear is to know the presence and power of the Holy Spirit who whose fruit is peace. If you abide in my word, and one of the ways we abide is through obedience, and we're just not obeying the word. We're just not doing it. Isn't it? We don't quite understand what that means, obeying him. Well, there are levels of obedience, and sometimes we can't distinguish between those levels but this is the secret our Lord is saying to the disciples of loving Jesus and producing fruit and that's obeying him and I just sit and marvel sometimes when Christians can read the word of God and walk away from it and never do what he told them to do there are levels of obedience in our life one of those levels is fear. We, we fear God. We're afraid of what God is going to do to us if we don't do this or we don't do that. Now, I'm not saying fear is not to be a part of our life. There is a biblical fear, and that's a fear that simply says, Father, I would rather die than bring shame and disgrace to you and my Savior. That's biblical fear. But some of us operate out of this motive of fear because we think God is sitting up in heaven going to zap us over the head with a big stick when we step out of line. I'm glad God doesn't do it that way. I'd, I'd have been out of business a long time ago. That's one level of obedience, fear. Another level is selfishness. And you hear that today in the prosperity theology the name it and claim it game, what can I get out of it? That's how we operate in a lot of areas of our life. We have a bargain basement faith. And we measure what we're doing by what God gives to me. Wow. And then there is what Jesus said. Love. If you love me, you will keep my word. He's now focusing on the relationship, the vine and the branches. Friends, we're still the servants, we're still the doulos, but we are now also friends, and the friend will reveal unto us what the Father's purpose and plan is for our lives. Wow. Wow. When I am centered and focused on that, then my love will be centered on the, give, the uh, giver and not the gift. He may give me nothing. Nothing. That's not what he's wanting me to understand. It's him. I am to focus on him. I have a personal relationship with him. No matter what he gives me, or no matter what he withholds from me. I was going through all that stuff on Q, uh, Monday with the CAT scan and the cystoscope and the same nurse that, that had asked me, how do you learn the Bible on Thursday up in the doctor's office was in there. She was preparing me for that cystoscope, and I can tell you again, folks, th there's no modesty in there. And we're, we're just, I'm sitting there, I'm just trying to be calm. And we began to talk about what was fixing to happen. And I said, well, Opal, the Lord's in control of this. This lady, <laughs> she, then she looked at me and she said, you know, the Lord has a way of teaching us, doesn't he? I said, yeah, he really does. He really does. And I'm thinking, my, I'm at your mercy. 
He has a way of teaching us. And sometimes we're so hard-headed, we don't hear it. When the difficult times come, when we're beginning squeezed from every side, we're so focused on the, the squeezing and the problem and the storm, we're not focused on the one who's in control of the storm. When my love is obeying him, I am focused on the giver and not the gift. And love does not measure sacrifice, folks. Jesus said that back in verse 13 of chapter 15. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Are we willing to sacrifice everything for him? I am sacrificing in ministry and service inside of the body of Christ. I'm so glad he didn't measure his sacrifice. He paid the penalty fully. He suffered in a way you and I will never have to suffer. And we can't always comprehend that. He gave us his all. And folks, if I love him the way he tells me to love him, with body, soul, mind, heart, all of my being, that love will never measure the cost. Never measure the cost. And that love living on the inside of me through the Holy Spirit is to be protect, perfected in a maturing love. And the world will begin to see that. And Jesus will be glorified. And now he's telling these disciples, the Holy Spirit is coming, is coming. He will testify of me. And you will testify of me because you've been with me through the beginning. Wow. Am I bearing witness to the Lord Jesus? Do I understand what he is saying to me? Do I comprehend what it means to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit? Now remember, we're talking about the divisions in, in number chapters and verses in the Bible. Scripture, John 15, 26 down through 16, 4, is all one unit. He's talking about the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. He's closed out one context in verse 25, and now he is beginning to take up again the promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gave to those disciples back in Luke 14. And he's relating the ministry of the Holy Spirit to those believers in this present life. And in the context, he's talking about persecution. If I'm producing fruit, the world's going to hate me because it hates him. And sometimes we can't deal with that, that the world would hate us. But the world will do that. How do I stand in the midst of ridicule and persecution and rejection and the anger and the bitterness? How do I do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what he's saying to them. And I want you to understand so you realize your relationship. The hatred of the world, he said, has already been expressed toward me. And now that you belong to me, the world's going to hate you because you don't belong to the world anymore. And this is where the person of the Holy Spirit comes in. He's coming back again to what he started in John chapter 14. So they will understand that the Holy Spirit is coming. God promised him to come. He promised him in the Old Testament. Jesus had promised him very clearly in his ministry, beginning with John 14, he told them that again. You need to understand the only way you're going to be able to face the persecution, the only way you're going to be able to withstand everything that's coming at you is because of the Holy Spirit living in the, on the inside of you. Now, not, not, notice what he said. He will bear witness, and so will you, because you've been with me from the beginning. So in the midst of that persecution, in the midst of the hatred, we are to be a witness to the Lord Jesus. Wow. If 
we don't do this on an everyday basis, how much more difficult will it be when the world is coming after us to bear testimony and witness to the Lord Jesus? And then he said, these things I have spoken to you, and he's talking about everything beginning back in John 13, so that you will not stumble. And as we make our way through this world of hatred, we're not to stumble. It's easy to stumble. We're still indwelt by a flesh nature. And when the world is coming at us so hot and heavy, it's easy to stumble. Easy to stumble. I think Monday morning, I, I came out. Laura lives around the corner from us, and she was walking her dog, Maddie, and I was talking to her in front of my driveway. Next door, my next door neighbor was having a fence put up. It's a man out there working diligently, and all of a sudden while we were talking, he let out a scream. And I looked up, and he was jumping around. He had smashed his finger, whatever he was doing, and he, he was jumping. I mean, he was hurting. I left to go back inside. Laura went by him and asked if there was anything to do. And I, I, after a while, I went back outside to see him. And I said, is there anything I can do for you? And he said, no. And then all of a sudden, without any prompting, he said, I want to apologize to you. He said, I said a curse, and I didn't hear it. I said a curse word. I didn't hear that curse word. And I said, I don't think I heard a curse word. He said, I did. And I want to apologize to you. That opened the door for me to share Jesus with him. In the midst, and his fingernail was about to come off. He smashed that thing. And when I began to share with him, he said, oh, I am a believer. I know the forgiveness of God. And that's why I think he was so ashamed of what had come out of his mouth. And I wanted to say, you know, there have been times in my life when something has happened like that, and if I spit, the grass would turn black. I just didn't say it out loud, you know what I mean? And he, he went on and on apologizing. I said, listen, it's okay. He told me what church he went to, and he said, I'm trying to bring my children up. <laughs> well, wow. Well, we face those things, and, and he's saying, the Holy Spirit on the inside will keep you from stumbling in the midst of all of this if you understand that you are indwelt by him. They will make you outcasts. And again, he's speaking to the disciples. Outcasts from the synagogues. They're going to kick you out. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think they're offering service to God. We're doing God a favor by getting rid of these people. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may, re you may remember that I told you of them. I didn't say this at the beginning because I was with you, but I'm going back into heaven. I will not leave you alone. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. So thankful that God has given us that person of the Holy Spirit to indwell us. And in the midst of this coming persecution, he said, you need to know who he is. So let me run out of time. Let me ask you this question. How well do you know the Holy Spirit? Go back to John chapter 14. In your quiet time, you can read through that. Our Lord, again, was talking to these troubled men, and he said, Let not your heart be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father but through me. And then in verse 7, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him, and you've seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, Philip, and yet you have not come to to know me I 
How long have you been a Christian? How well do you know me? And then in verse 16, I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him and know him, but you know him because he abides within you. How well do you know the Holy Spirit? So let me leave with this, and I'll take it back up next week. Some of us never seem to comprehend why God sent the Holy Spirit, much less who the Holy Spirit is. So let me see if I can clarify this. The Holy Spirit is eternal. He's God. He's always existed. He's always at work. But in the Old Testament, he did not indwell every believer. He would come upon some and empower them, and others he would come to indwell, but it wasn't permanent. That's why David prayed in Psalm 51, don't take your spirit away from me. That's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, something decidedly different happened. On the day of Pentecost, which was on God's schedule from eternity, the Holy Spirit came down. And the day that he came down, these things happened. Number one, he came to indwell every individual believer. There were 120 of them in that upper room. And he came to indwell every one of them. Secondly, he came to indwell the church corporately. The 120 in that upper room were meshed and molded into the body of Christ. And now he was indwelling the church. And the third thing, and I'll leave you with this, he came to indwell and to indwell permanently. He'll never leave us. Never leave us. He's not a commuter. He doesn't come in in the morning and go out at night when you go to bed. He lives in you and will dwell in you forever and forever and forever. So let me ask this last question for Michael Thomas. Are you bringing honor and glory to the Lord Jesus? Can people look at you and say, wow, what a distinct difference in their life and their life? We face those things, folks. Monday right before that sister scope, and I can tell you that wasn't a pleasant thing. That's not a pleasant thing. And take a catheter out, and then boom, they're gone. And I said to the doctor, can I pray with you before we start? And I've already shared with him. I know he's not of our faith, but I've. He said, sure, certainly you can. So I just prayed real quick. Not a long prayer guide and direct this doctor's mind and hand. Thank you for eternal life in Jesus. That's all I said. And when I said amen, all of a sudden he said, wow, I need you to go with me all day long through these rooms. That says a whole lot. And again, not because I'm a super saint. I knew what I was about to experience. Are we bringing glory to the Father, honor your word in our life tonight because you, we have heard you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's go to the Lord in, in prayer. Father, you've heard these requests. Father, you know the ones that, Father, that even haven't been mentioned and those we don't even know about yet. But, Father, I thank you for the opportunity to bring all these before you. I pray that you'd be faithful to, to work in each and every situation, Father, uh, work your will. Father, we've made our request known, but we, we're looking for your will. So, Father, I pray that you would watch over and protect us. Father, continue to keep your hand on the refuge. Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing here. Father, in the sanctuary, those, Father, we're touching even online. Father, for all the opportunities we have to witness to people, Father, in some of the most difficult situations we may be in, we're still able to lift you up and bear witness to your faithfulness. Father, pray you'd be with the Awanas as they meet following this. And um, Lord, just watch over and protect those teachers. Father, they'd be a witness for you. Father, pray you forgive us where we fail you and bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' name.